Uh, so welcome to uh, our roundtable. This is the first of several uh, roundtables that are going to be put on by week 10. And the, the focus in this one is on how climate groups can influence local government. My name is Dave Thompson. I'm one of the volunteers on WECAN's local government team. I'm also a consultant with Policy Link Research Canada and a candidate in the Victoria 2022 election. WECAN is the West Coast Climate Action Network. Uh, you can see the website at westcoastclimateaction.ca. We work to serve, support, amplify, and promote the multitude of climate action organizations and initiatives in British Columbia. Before we get started today, I just wanted to do a land acknowledgement, and I would encourage everyone to feel free to put your own land acknowledgement into the chat box. So this is a, uh, a we can uh, land acknowledgement that we're working on. We welcome your feedback on it. Uh, as we gather today, we acknowledge that the land we now refer to as British Columbia has been home to diverse indigenous peoples for thousands of years. Since BC was colonized in 1858, local First Nations have faced discrimination, violence, displacement, and cultural erasure. The West Coast Climate Action Network recognizes the right of BC's Indigenous nations to assert and implement their Aboriginal title, rights, treaty rights, and right of self-determination and sovereignty as people within their traditional territories. We aim to foster a welcoming and respectful gathering place for Indigenous climate leaders who are working on similar issues, where we can come together to build and exchange knowledge and experiences to guide us into the future. As for me, I live and work in the territory of the Lekwungen people, whose descendants include the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, who continue to work and live on these lands, also known as Victoria and region. Unlike much of BC, there are uh, so-called treaties that apply to these lands here, the Douglas treaties. It's an understatement that these were unclear at the time, signed in dubious circumstances, and over time were not honored by the Crown. I'd be happy to discuss further if anyone wants to reach out to me on that. So as we all know, it is our one of our responsibilities is to minimize our impact on this land that we're on. And climate change is already having a major impact as we saw last year. Climate action needs to be accelerated rapidly at all levels of government, including municipal government. So we can, and the local government team of WECAN will be doing a number of different things in the coming months and years. Today's the first in a series of roundtables we'll be organizing. Uh, the themes broadly are municipal climate action and the importance of the 2022 municipal election. And we hope that voters across BC in October this year, we'll elect climate champions to local councils. So before we get going, I'll just uh, give a little guide to how the discussion is gonna work today. Uh, so on the agenda, we will have uh, three presenters each taking 10 minutes, uh, a moderated discussion among the presenters, uh, participant questions, that's you to the panelists, and then a quick wrap up uh, conclusions and how, how we can all get involved in our community. Please feel free to use the chat box. Uh, you can put your questions for the panelists in the chat and you can address them to a specific panelist or you can address them to the group overall. Uh, the questions will then be read out to the panelists and uh, we, you can also add your comments and, and have discussions within the chat as well. We will be recording the meeting and gathering the conversation from the chat. Uh, and today we're pleased to have a really great panel of conversation leaders. So our panelists uh, in order are Sebastian Saida. He's the president of Force of Nature Alliance and a director of We Can. Alex Lidstone is the executive director of the Climate Caucus and a graduate of the University of Sussex in both an LLB and an MSc in climate change development and policy. And Ben Giselbracht, Gesselbracht, sorry, uh, city councillor and regional district director in the NIMO, a climate champion and instrumental in getting the NIMO to use donut economics in developing its official community plan. This group is going to be moderated by Dr. Deb Morrison, educator and learning designer at Clear Environmental, Climate Learning for Empowerment, Action and Resilience, 
as well as an Islands Trust trustee for North Pender Island. Many thanks in advance to our panelists and our moderator. Um, we can all just do this little clapping thing to indicate that. Uh, and Deb, right now we will turn it over to you. Thank you. So we will go ahead and start with Sebastian. And if you um, want to share any slides or anything, could you go ahead with that? So Sebastian can take it away. Okay, great. So I'm sharing my screen. Do people see this as a slideshow now? Yep. Okay, great. So uh, my name is Sebastian Saida. Uh, as, as David mentioned, um, I am the president of Force of Nature Alliance, which is a Metro Vancouver climate action organization focusing on climate action at the municipal level. I'm also the secretary of WeCan and a candidate in the uh, 2022 uh, municipal elections in Surrey here. So what I've decided to do for my 10 minute uh, presentation here, which is not a lot of time, is to briefly present um, sort of the climate emergency campaign we launched in 2019 and is still ongoing to this day in the city of Surrey. And I'm presenting it for the sake of explaining one key concept in GAN style organizing, and that is the concept of a theory of change. So um, just wanna set the stage a bit. So climate emergency declarations um, sort of really got, a, got rolling in 2018 here. They started in 2016 in Australia, but here in the sort of Metro van region, they really started in 2018 with Vancouver. Um, Force of Nature was involved in a lot of these declarations across Metro van, um, either through our local climate action team, sort of taking that effort on as their main uh, project or otherwise um, having a, providing support to other campaigns and other groups um, that were doing similar campaigns. Um, Surrey for Future, which is now the sort of local group of um, Force of Nature here in Surrey, uh, started in 2018 as an organization to organize climate protests in Surrey. And our partner group in this was um, Climate Clock, which is a youth organization that would later become the uh, Surrey branch of the sustainability teams. Um, so we, we got involved first by sending our field organizer to help out and uh, put out a call for Surrey volunteers. And that's when I got involved here in Surrey. Uh, despite being a longtime Surrey resident, I was actually organizing in New Westminster, which is a very, very, very different city than Surrey um, previous to that. So uh, I wanted to take everything sort of a little bit far back and not get into too much specifics and just talk about some general stuff here. So as I said, I was going to be talking about the theory of change. And so the gentleman you see on your screen here is Marshall Gans, who's a researcher in the States. Um, he was uh, a longtime uh, member of the uh, United Farm Workers, and his sort of theories of organizing would uh, provide the basis of the Obama campaign in 2008. So uh, he has a whole theory uh, on how to organize, um, how to do this stuff. And I would, uh, for people who are interested in this, I would check out the organization Organizing for Change here in BC. They put out a really good handbook on this, and I'm going to be linking to that at the end of my presentation. So a theory of change is a statement that's kind of like this. So if we do tactics, then change because of reasons. So I'm just going to go through each of these and talk about how we thought about it in this campaign. So for the change that we wanted, a climate emergency really doesn't do anything on its own, right? It's like when Michael Scott in the office yelled out, I declare bankruptcy, right? It doesn't really do anything because it doesn't have any specific weight. So in addition to the actual climate emergency declaration we wanted from the city, we also wanted to bundle that with the idea of them committing to emissions targets based on the IPCC latest science. And then also, of course, just committing to those emissions isn't good enough. You need a plan to get there. So we also wanted to see a climate change plan put into place by the city of Surrey. So if we talk about the change, so the change is we want a city plan that would reduce emissions in line with the IPCC's recommendations to limit global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. So the next part here is the because. So why is the city of Surrey gonna do this? And this is where my full sort of cynical brain is gonna be uh, uh, active here. So cities, mayors and councils, councils, often like receiving awards or otherwise being flattered. So as a proof here on that same night of November 4th, when we actually uh, got this motion passed, um, there was a big hubbub that the uh, city was quite proud of a um, uh, were they one for a coastal flood ad adaptation strategy? And then more recently, there was a council that actually listed all of the environmental awards the city won as part of justifying a, a development um, to uh, our regional government. So I'm sure people are familiar with all these awards that councils get. So another thing would be because mayors and councils are usually seeking re-election. If not re-election, then they're at least worried about the reputation and legacy. And finally, at least some of them are going to have uh, sort of good values and actually care about the climate as people themselves. 
So this is sort of our because. The because is we relied on was the self-interest of mayor and council. And we talked the tactics. The tactics are the specific things that we did to try and get this enacted. Tactics are, there's millions and millions of them and uh, different ones are suited for different things. And at the end of this, I'll give a, a brief rundown of what I think are some of the most important things in local government. But for what we did here is we first presented to an appropriate committee. So the motion could be recommended to council so they could vote on it, right? This is the mechanistic thing that has to happen as part of this plan. Uh, we, wanted, we educated councillors on why such a declaration would mean and the importance of cities taking action on climate change. This was lobbying meetings and emails. We ended up meeting with every single member of council, um, except for the mayor, uh, during that. And we had great uh, feedback. And we had a great uh, sort of relationship building with them. We also engaged with traditional and social media to give the issue visibility and engage as many potential voters as possible. So that potential voters is super important because we're really um, thinking about making sure that council understands that this is an election issue. We wanna make sure climate is an election issue, right? So, uh, and then the last here is to demonstrate support among citizens for such an action by turning up to council meetings in large numbers and in a visible way. So my next slide here is a picture from that night. This is November 4th, the night that we got the um, declaration. You can see that there's a bunch of us in green shirts. This is actually taken before the vote was taken. And we had a lot of green shirts that we gave out to people to put on because you know you can't have signs in council but if everybody's wearing the same color and you tell them in advance why you're doing it they know why you're there so if you can get 70 people out which is the amount that we got that day out to a council meeting that's a big deal right usually 70 people don't show up to a council meeting so if we go back to that idea of a theory of change we can say sort of in a, a little bit of an abbreviated form here that if we demonstrate that citizen support for the motion they will pass the motion because they want to look good and get reelected, right? That's the theory of change that we had. Uh, this is uh, sort of a, a kind of like a map uh, chart of the way campaigns often go. And it's one way of looking at how this campaign happened. So um, at the beginning, you know, we presented to committee. That was sort of the, the beginning of it. And we were really announcing ourselves that we're doing this campaign. The next step was actually getting the motion passed. So this wasn't really the end goal of the campaign, right? Because the end goal of the campaign is actually limiting the warming to 1.5 degrees, or at least getting a city policy in place that uh, facilitates that, right? So this became kind of like a, a sub goal in this major process of this ongoing uh, campaign, right? So the next thing that would happen is, you know, shaping the climate change action strategy. So once the motion was passed, we actually had to consult with staff and be, be on staff quite a bit to try and get them to um, move it forward. Unfortunately, this is sort of one of those things where we didn't really have a staff champion. And I'm hoping that we can talk about that in our discussion, how staff champions are really important, but we really didn't have one. And this plan actually floundered for a bit and it still actually is um, about a year and a half late um, according to the original timeline. So this is definitely like a lesson learned in terms of getting staff on side. And then the really the big mountaintop goal is going to be actually passing the, the strategy, right? So the strategy is right now being developed, but we have to actually pass it in the end. Um, and then, of course, after you pass it, it has to be implemented. Uh, council actually has to follow it, right? So just passing it's not good enough. We actually have to continue on, monitor, make sure that we're on it. And um, it sort of speaks to the need for organizations to exist and to constantly be engaged with the political process. Um, this is a really interesting quote that I really like. A map is not the territory. So as you know, if you have a map of a place, it doesn't necessarily represent the place exactly, uh, and it can create distortions. So if we look at that old, um, uh, the previous chart I have here, um, this is only one way of looking at this campaign, and it looks at the campaign separate from everything else. So what I want to do here is present it in a different way. So this is another way that uh, GANS looks at um, different kinds of campaigns and goals when you have nested goals. So if the climate change action strategy is our main campaign here, our first nested goal might be getting the motion passed. Our next one is actually passing the strategy once it's developed. Um, but at this time, we were doing a whole bunch of other stuff. We actually ended up going to court with the city of Surrey over uh, Bear Creek Park. This was a huge thing that we did that created uh, lots of people got on our mailing list, lots of uh, fundraising happened. And a lot of that petitioning, I, I see some people that I only know from the Bear Creek Park campaign in this uh, meeting today, so you can see that it means that our reach has increased quite a bit. That's the increase in resources that help us to actually um, execute the rest of these campaigns, right? So taking the city of Syria to court, fortunately we lost, but um, as part of this strengthening our organization and being able to be 
um, in a place where we can get the best possible climate action, it was good, right? And that's kind of our really big mountain top goal is the strongest possible climate action in Surrey. And what I wanna uh, suggest by this is that you can always rethink what your, um, uh, what your campaign looks like, how it interacts with other campaigns and how you can reconsider and reconfigure it sort of in your mind. Um, I am running out of time, so I'm actually going to skip my little toolbox here. Maybe we can bring some of this up uh, in the discussion, just some of the main things that I think are super important. And I will be sending this um, slide deck out to folks. But I wanted to just end this sort of 10 minute conversation with just one important thing. I want to give everybody in this call sort of permission to think of yourselves as organizers. This is a huge thing for me in my sort of development as an organizer, um, getting over this sort of um, uh, imposter syndrome. And thinking that you know you are a person who is fighting for the right thing. There are countless people across the world uh, fighting for the climate, and you're sort of part of this community. And you know, lean on your fellow climate activists, um, get organized, and you know you can do uh, a lot in this world. Um, so that's my sort of super brief ten minute presentation. I have some links here, including a good article by the David Suzuki Foundation, actually on this campaign that goes into a lot more detail for those that are interested. So with uh, forty five seconds over, I can. Uh, Oh, you're this. doing great. Thank you so much. Um, and Sebastian, can I ask you to copy the links from your presentation and throw them in the chat too? Because the the last toolkit links, that'd be wonderful if we could share Will them. Do. Thank you. So thank you very, very much. And big thanks for Sebastian in the chat and share your gratitude, please. Um, all right. So we're going to jump over now to Alex. And so Alex, go ahead. If you have anything that you want to share visually, go ahead and do that as well. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, we got you. Perfect. OK, um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Uh, my name is Alex Lidstone. I am executive director of Climate Caucus, and I am calling in from the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Sutina First Nations, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations, and all other people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of southern Alberta. So I am actually calling in from Calgary. Um, but my, I, I was born and raised in Vancouver, so I have BC at heart. Um, so I guess quickly, I'll just go over um, Climate Caucus is a national network of over 400 locally elected officials. Um, our mandate is 1100, so it's one planet, 10 years, no one left behind. Uh, and we operate by supporting uh, elected officials in three main ways, which is a support network, sharing resources, and advocating to higher levels of government. Um, so I'm just mostly coming here today to share with you my experiences from working with locally elected officials across Canada um, and hopefully the information and things that I learned and I'm able to share with you will help all of you in your um, engagement and advocacy with your own local governments. Um, so so these are sort of the things that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, ultimately, I argue that the most important thing to remember for effective local government engagement is the significance of people on the ground in developing and passing policy. Um, the second most important thing, I argue, is building strong two-way relationships with your council. Uh, so the first thing I'll cover is this sort of local government trifecta, which Sebastian kind of mentioned. Um, essentially, from all my experience of talking with people, they say that the, the most effective way to move policy is with these three things in place, a staff champion, a council champion, and people on the ground. So the counselor, that makes sense. Um, staff is really, really important. Sebastian, Sebastian mentioned this sort of, um, but they have a lot of power. So they can just sort of put one line in a report to council, um, hinting about how they feel about something and that can affect your council vote. So um, they wield a lot of power, but ultimately the people on the ground, which refers to all of you, um, you also hold a lot of power. So uh, your relationship with council needs to be dynamic and positive. Um, lots of people want to hold council's feet to the fire, or get things through that they're, that they're demanding. I hear that a lot. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more in terms of uh, how to build this effective relationship. So um, for relationships, 
I find it works best to have a constructive and positive relationship with your council or your council champion. Um, so we think about what you want that relationship to look like ultimately. Um, and remember that locally elected officials have a lot of emails coming to them every day. And a lot of them are actually really not nice. Um, I work really closely with a few women counselors and they've had death threats um, and, and things like that coming into their inbox. So as you're emailing your counselor, think about the other things that they're gonna be getting. Um, your locally electeds are, are just people like you and me and they will gravitate towards relationships that are regenerative rather than depleting. So you want them to feel comfortable coming to you with things um, and you want to think about what you can offer them. So if you're connected with lots of people in the community, which I know pretty much everyone on this call is, um, there's a lot of things that you can bring to benefit them. So you can conduct like a letter writing campaign where everyone in your network writes letters to council asking them to vote on something your champion is trying to pass. Uh, you can fill council chambers as Sebastian was mentioning in his case study there. That's really important. Uh, you can also fill the Zoom call if you're doing it on Zoom or other, other like online virtual council meetings. Um, and you can think of other ways that you can show up for them, but just you can highlight that in your in your emails and things. Um, also, most elected officials are only paid for a part time job, especially in the like smaller and more rural communities in BC. So they'll often work actually one or two other jobs as well as being a counselor. And they're just in this position because they really care about the community and they want to make a difference. So they're super busy, they're stretched super thin, and they'll value anything that you can do to make their job easier. So when it comes to things that you want to see, just ask ask nicely. You can maybe write like a briefing note or a one pager for them or something. And maybe don't forget to highlight the things that they're already doing that uh, that you like and you can build them up. Um, another key thing I just want to touch on is like the roles of council and the roles of staff. So council typically sets policy direction and staff writes the bylaws of the legislation. So when you're submitting your asks and things, uh, it's better to focus on outcomes rather than how to get there. And then the staff will ultimately do the research. Um, they typically don't love it. Like when you've written out exactly it, like the steps that you want to see taken um, in all levels of government, that, that advocacy uh, gets a little bit of pushback. Um, however, this may be different in small and rural communities where citizens will be required to play a bit of a greater role in helping out with climate plans and targets. Um, so I just briefly wanted to go over some tips of taking items to council. This is from our counselor's handbook. So we have a long list of it. I can share the resource afterwards, but um, I just pulled out a few of the key ones. So uh, it's don't take more than one proposed item to council. So that makes it harder for them to approve. Um, break the proposed plan into steps and make those steps clear and understandable. Know whether it's been proposed before come prepared with some potential funding sources and research if it's been done before because it's always easier um, to do things that have already been done in other councils. Um, benefits of partnering with community and environmental organizations and climate hubs. Um, so a lot of what your groups are like doing these, these community organizations and they're really, really great and they're really helpful. Um, so they offer efficient and effective coordination of climate change and resiliency plans. Um, and there's essentially, I'm going to just skip through this slide pretty quickly, but you can sort of read through it. But these are really, really great. Um, and it's really helpful for to have sort of one voice coming to council and your counselor being able to speak to, to one group in sort of one go. Um, so I highly recommend Climate Hubs. We work closely with, uh, with, the, uh, um, yeah, with all of the Climate Hubs across the country. Um, but there's lots of other organizations that are doing very similar things. So if you are not connected with your local group that's connected to your council, Council, then I highly recommend it. Um, and if you uh, and if you don't have a local climate hub or another sort of community group, um, then I would highly recommend starting one. Um, so small and rural communities, I did mention I would talk about this a little bit more. Um, so they may only have one or two staff who are trying to keep the community running and they don't necessarily have capacity to think about climate. Um, so citizen engagement is really, really important here. Um, and oftentimes citizens will actually act as climate staff for council, which is a really great and constructive way to get involved and help out. So if you live in a small community and you don't have a citizen climate committee, then you can email me and I can give you some resources to get one started. There's lots of good examples like uh, in Powell River, there's one. Um, and essentially, yeah, you can, that's a really great way to 
to, to offer your help and to, to sort of bridge the capacity gap that they're really experiencing. Alternatively, you can keep this in mind when you're emailing your counselor asking for something, you can offer to help them. So I was talking to Caroline Leishman in Powell River the other day, and she said that every time someone emails her asking for something from counsel, she says, let's go for a coffee and, uh, and you can do all the research and work for me and then we can get it done for you. So um, if you can offer to do that, some people might not, some counselors might not be as brave to ask you to go for a coffee, but maybe you can do the offering. And the last thing I wanna talk about is sorry i'm not actually sure if i'm over time or not <laughs> i forgot to start a timer so hopefully we're doing okay but um so i'm in calgary and i'm involved with the calgary climate hub quite a bit and uh, so i figured i would give it as a little bit of a case study because we did just have a municipal election um back in october and i know you have one coming up and i thought that their way of uh, engaging with council was really great and so it may be helpful for some of you um Essentially, what they did was they met with all of the candidates during campaigns so that when the election happened, they already knew who their allies were going to be on council, who was going to be a bit stickier, um, things like that. And um, it was essentially this advocacy that they were doing beforehand, which led to the net zero language being included in our Calgary Climate Emergency Declaration, which was passed uh, just last month. So, um, so that's really great. And then they had post-election meetings with all of council. Um, some of them were more introductory, being like, you know, hey, we're the Climate Hub. If you have any questions about climate and uh, being connected with the community, uh, you can reach out to us. And others were more like strategizing with the councillor. So saying, okay, we want to get X, Y, and Z through. This is what we need from the city uh, and the community Community to be coming out and doing. Um, these are the key dates that we need you to be filling the council chambers and things. And so it really is a two way relationship there. Um, because then going back, we have uh, a series of one pagers and documents and things that we're really looking to see um, uh, for them to be able to fulfill their net zero declaration, which they passed. Um, they also had a letter writing campaign prior to their emergency declaration vote. So everyone would uh, write letters to their ward counselors, um, asking them to vote on it. Um, so yeah, ultimately, um, I think that this is a really good example of a two way street. So the climate hubs fills council chambers, they provide input on council policies and motions. There's a lot of uh, really good experts involved in there. Um, and they are able to bring other experts from interest like, uh, like buildings experts, solar experts, things like that into council to talk about how these motions will uh, affect their livelihoods and their careers. Um, and then they're also able to ask for the things that they're looking for. So, um, so yeah, it's a great model. And ultimately, we're connected with uh, Climate Hubs and some other local organizations across the country. So if anyone has any questions on any of that, or needs research, uh, yeah, resources on any of the things I've mentioned previously, you can reach out to me. And I guess my very last slide is just my conclusions. So if there's anything you want to take away from what I just said, it's understand the importance of community. So people on the ground are necessary to pass good policy, build your relationship with council. And remember, it's a two way street and offer to help in whatever way you can, because councils are stretched very thin. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. That's my timer music. <laughs> so, great job. Thank you. Um, and if we can show appreciation for Alex in the um, chat, that would be terrific. Thank you very much, Alex. There's a number of things there that are new to me that I actually have to uh, investigate. So, um, and any links that you can drop into the chat related to your talk would be really helpful for folks too. Thank you. All right, Ben, if we can have you. Good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Gesselbrock. I'm a counselor at the city of Nanaimo and um, uh, zooming in here from uh, Nanaimo territory. Uh, yeah, I'd like to share a, a few stories of, of the success that we've had on, on our council and the tremendous amount of support uh, that uh, has really made a huge difference in, in what's been moved through. Um, We've been very fortunate to have quite a uh, an active uh, local climate network, uh, Heather Bates and the Nanaimo Climate Action Network, and then relied very heavily on the amazing work of Alex Lidstone and the Climate Caucus, um, and uh, just really acknowledge the power of networks. Uh, at the end of the day, everything comes down to democracy and uh, initiative. And when, when groups of people get together and, and coordinate and connect, uh, it's amazing what can be done. And as a first time counselor, uh, I'm always amazed actually uh, at how much of an influence and impact uh, cities do have on climate action. 
um, you know, city policies and budgets and investments that, you know, affect transportation, building efficiency, uh, land use, parks, natural spaces, and uh, also the cities are a huge provincial lobby. And so with the work, uh, you know, with Alex, we've been able to put together uh, resolutions through the, the Union of British Columbia Municipalities, which the province looks at very closely and been able to help uh, move forward, you know, circular economy uh, initiatives uh, at the provincial level and uh, really be loud that uh, municipalities are, are taking climate action seriously and, and we want provincial investment uh, uh, to do so. So, the, you know, with the power of the network, it, it is information dissemination and, and, and mobilization. And um, I think a, a really critical timing uh, for networks and, and empowering, you know, community action is, uh, you know, at election time is, is a great place where it begins. And we're, we're fortunate, well, not fortunate, but uh, coming up here, we've got an election for the municipalities in, in BC. Uh, this October. So it's an excellent time to really start organizing and uh, capitalize on this. And the, the, the critical element in a lot of success to move uh, municipalities forward in climate action is finding those climate champions that can be on the council and, and having a strong uh, relationship uh, with them. So, you know, at election, you can really present, you know, as being a, a climate action network and demonstrate, you know, the size of your network and, and, and the people on it and, and start building those agreements with those councillors and then support them in, in, in raising their profile so that when they're on council, um, you can really utilize that to, to navigate, um, you know, through that four year term, because there's some pretty important uh, uh, gate posts in, in, a, in a term. And, you know, once you have a, a climate champion, and a few climate champions or even a council of climate champions elected uh, that that first year is when the council is putting together a strategic plan and you can get strong uh, 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 targets and commitments to uh, climate action um, in in the actual uh, policy documents that's going to be guiding council for this year that can always be looked back at and and to demonstrate that to show that the council has, has made a commitment to that and that needs to move forward so with, uh, with identifying those climate champions and developing that strong relationship, that's a, a really critical uh, part in, in, in influencing what happens. Now, you know, with, with council, it's always a mixed bag of people. Uh, not all our council members are, are climate champions. And so at, at critical moments, I rely so much on uh, the networks uh, to make sure that important policy gets it gets moved through. So there's been a few instances in my term when we we had a climate uh, declaration, climate emergency declaration. Uh, another instance when we um, had a big push, we were very strapped uh, for for cash in our community, but we didn't have a manager of sustainability. And uh, we, we needed to have, you know, the most important thing is having staff that'll actually do the work and uh, was able to beforehand send out an email to our climate action network. And, uh, and, and what that turned out was a hundred emails back to our mayor and council before critical votes. And it's funny as a counselor, your inputs of information are coming from all angles, but one critical one is your email. And it's sort of like a little, uh, 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 a vote system where the for and against emails you get can really sway. And especially if you're a counselor that's sitting on the fences on things, you're really worried about uh, reputation, being elected again, and, and just whether you're doing what the community wants. And so those emails make a big, big difference. So there's one instance when we were, we had a uh, declaration about just saying about our position about old growth and wanting the, the provincial government to uh, take action on that seriously. And it, it kicked up a dust storm with um, one of the, the United Steelworkers Union, and they sent a, a ton of, of emails to council saying that we shouldn't be sticking our nose in an issue like this. And uh, I could really get a sense from some of the council members that weren't quite sure worried about it. And I was able to send an email to our climate action network. And all of a sudden, you know, where we see 100 emails from the union, there was 250 from the climate action network and, and, and the motion passed. And as a counselor, I, I, it makes a huge, huge difference to be able to have that type of support. Another type of thing that uh, is really important in, in cities are, are really 
investing in, in community and public engagement, always seeing what the, the community wants on certain items. And so we're in the middle in Nanaimo doing our official community plan. And uh, we're, we're looking at, you know, the major policy document of our community it says how land use is going to be used, where we're going to make big investments over the next 10 years. And each stage has a public engagement process. And, uh, you know, one of them was about investing in, 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 in climate action, increasing our staffing in that area, using certain land use policies that were going to uh, increase density and, 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 and have a, a more ambitious um, a more ambitious step code implementation. And so it, it asked these questions of community while they're in favor. And so I was able to send that email out to the, the Climate Action Network that please go online, fill out this engagement form and you know, save the things that you, you want around, around climate action. Well, when we, when we received back the uh, public input, there was so much input on people taking initiative uh, on climate action that the staff were like, this doesn't make any sense. And, and they, they, they even went further to send like a statistically a valid uh, 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 mail-in ballot just to see if you know, their, their numbers were off, but it made a huge difference. And so at every point, if we're making sure that the feedback to the entire council is that people find climate action important, and this is something that we need to apply in all different decisions in council, it just keeps reinforcing that, that message. And, and it's been very effective here uh, in Nanaimo. And one of the, the key things is for effectiveness of networks is to really understand the different procedures and, and timing uh, with council and that relationship with the with council your climate council um, champion is, is is helpful and you can also then through that and through the different engagement touch points figure out who are those key staff members that are making decisions and bringing forward to council because if you can develop a, a, a relationship with a staff member they can bring and initiate items to the council as well and give a heads up on, on certain items. And um, we had a proposal from WeCan uh, asking for a certain amount of funding. And I, I think there was a relationship with staff. And so staff presented uh, from our uh, local climate action network uh, proposals and, and recommending that we provide funding. And it made the decision that much more easier for our council. And we've actually provided funding to our local climate action uh, network. Um, another thing too uh, is really helpful for, for council members is that uh, when you're on a city council, uh, you're not like a provincial MP and you've got very little staff and support. And so any information uh, support researching certain items um, is, is hugely uh, beneficial. And, and I rely a lot on the Climate Caucus to, to get information, but it's amazing. And in a community, there's so many professionals and individuals with time, like there's quite a large retiree uh, um, numbers in, in, in Nanaimo and folks that really know their stuff and can provide huge support. We had one where there is a, a decision on um, whether to allow development uh, in a riparian setback. And I had one member from the community who was a lawyer do all this research on case law, whether you know, we could be sued for, for holding strong on our, uh, on, on our setbacks. And uh, it, very helpful to be confident to, to, to hold, hold ground. And so I think that uh, what an asset, and I just really wanna raise my hands to the organizers and all the groups that are here, uh, uh, you know, supporting uh, their local government in climate action, because it, it is what makes a difference. And I can really feel the, the, the tide changing. And, uh, and this, is, this is what change looks like. So thank you everyone for their time and participating in this and uh, it, it's paying off. So uh, hopefully this next round of elections, uh, get out there early and find those climate, champions do the research on policy and and demand that we really push the limits because i think this next round in the municipal elections uh we can we can make some serious movement forward so thank you thank you thank you so much and uh, again if we can share thanks for ben in the chat that would be terrific um i'm really actually enjoying the chat as it flies by i'm like oh those are great specific thank yous so thank you very much for that everybody who's here um all right so we're gonna dive into a conversation among us a little bit more and think about 
um, some of the big themes that were coming up and we'll also draw from some of the questions and comments from participants as well. So to start us out, um, all of you have actually named the idea of networks of networks or networks of organizations as really critical to being able to um, think about how to do this work, whether it's activating climate champions or whether it's helping resource them once they're in space, building relationships with different organizations and staff. So can you say, can you provide some concrete examples of how you've seen this play out for folks or help folks think about how to connect into these types of networks? I know the We Can Network itself is, is one of those mechanisms, but if you can give examples in your local area and we'll just get the spotlight on all three of the speakers. I'll work on that. All right, so anybody want to start, Ben, Alex or Sebastian? Uh, maybe just briefly, um, sort of in the spirit of we can, I really like um, any kind of coalition building that can occur on a local level. Um, we found it pretty effective um, in a couple of different places to uh, bring together organizations that have mutual aims, especially if you have organizations that aren't actually climate organizations or climate organizations um, as their main focus. Um, you know, putting out a press release with seven or eight organizations that have endorsed a call for something is great. Um, if you do that proactively and not in a way where you're just asking people to support your projects, um, then you can build those friendships and those relationships that will continue sort of onward. Um, a lot of the times, uh, I don't think we're doing that enough with Indigenous folks, and we're not doing that enough with talking to labor as well. And those are two ways that, uh, two groups that climate really, climate champions need to really um, reach, reach over and um, uh, make those coalitions and alliances with. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I can jump in. Um, I think something that's really important about networks is that, um, especially with climate change, it's a very complex problem that we're all trying to solve very quickly. Um, and so I think it's the information sharing and the connecting people um, so that you can, I guess, do things as quickly as possible and not trying to just move on your own that that really helps. Um, I guess an example that Ben was uh, talking to me about earlier that uh, we did together um, was we started a zero waste group in uh, through Climate Caucus last year. And uh, through that, we had um, uh, Ben and one other expert were chairing the group, uh, Sue Maxwell, who's a uh, zero waste and circular economy expert. Um, and we were able to connect locally elected officials to um, various experts through on different topics with presentations throughout the, throughout the, the, the year, I guess. I think we had 10 presentations. Um, and then through that, we were able to develop some UBCM resolutions, which is the Union of BC Municipalities. Um, and we had those passed by, I think every um, local area in BC had uh, passed each of them. And then so they all went through to UBCM and then they were voted on. And ultimately now there's a plan for a circular economy strategy in the roadmap to 2030. So we do think that all of that sort of helps and comes together um uh through all of the the advocacy and connecting folks um and then i guess to answer your second part which is the how to connect to networks um yeah i think that like this is a great network to connect to i know i also mentioned um climate hubs and things i think once you sort of get involved like networks are very open and they usually want everyone to come in and share because as long as you have something to give then uh you'll also be able to receive a lot um so once you're there you know, people are really welcoming and things um and then you can sort of connect to other ones i guess because a lot of the networks are also connected uh if you're not in climate caucus you can also join uh, sign up to the newsletter and everything um um, we have lots of uh, calls that are open to to everyone who's not just electeds as well, and we have summits and things. So you're always welcome to join ours. Ben, do you want to add anything else? I don't know. I think that was good. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kathy. I'm sorry that I was a little bit late. I, I was detained by an appointment, but I just wanted to say that I was invited by a force of nature to come tonight. So I'm grateful for the invitation. And as I'm listening to what people are saying, I'm I'm very interested in what you folks are doing. Um, it's new to me in some ways because um, I just joined Stream Keepers. I'm a preschool teacher. I am yeah. a early child educator. And my hopes is to not only educate myself and support what you're doing, but also to share that with the families and get them involved. And Kathy, if you have a specific question, if you can throw that in the chat, we're working through a series of questions on a back channel here. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, all right. So then um, there's a couple other questions about how we engage in sort of like what does climate um, activism look or advocacy look like in terms of partisanship or not? Um, and so I there's a couple questions in the chat related to that that I thought were really interesting. And and I was thinking about it as you're speaking because we have a lot of <laughs> questions about that inside elected spaces. Is it partisan to get behind a single counselor? And so maybe can we talk about some first some nonpartisan strategies for advocating for climate champions? Because there are a, a bevy of them. <laughs> so any any thoughts about like how do you actually start at the ground level to try and get everyone to talk about climate or to advocate for it? Any thoughts on that? I, I've, I've got a comment, I, you know, it's it's this question of partisan and not partisan, like at the end of the day, it comes to, down to values and um, it gets political no matter what. But mm -hmm. I, uh, I think that one way is, you know, with the election, it's a good opportunity to um, get individuals that are knowledgeable, maybe some past climate uh, champions that were on council and, and develop a bit of a next steps for uh, your climate policy for your, your, your region, wherever you're at now and what can be done. Um, and then have that as a document uh, before the election and then put it out there to whatever councillors want or candidates want to sign on to that and commit to you know, moving those things forward gives an opportunity for, for anybody to, to be part of that. Um, mm -hmm. as a way to sort of broaden it out and what we're, I think we're going to try to do here in Nanaimo. That's great. Other thoughts related to the partisan, nonpartisan, any, anything related to that? Um, yeah, I guess I can just say a couple of things. Uh, I do work on climate action in, in the city of Calgary, which as you can imagine is a little split. Um, and so I don't know if I would necessarily say it's like partisan or nonpartisan, but coming back to sort of Ben's like values conversation, um, there's definitely people on sort of either side, but I guess the, usually the way that we try and approach it is by making sure that the things that we're suggesting, we sort of have all of the extra arguments because you can pretty much any climate action that you're doing also has other benefits to it. There's also usually an economic benefit, which other folks that are not liking climate action will probably want that. Um, and then there's other like health benefits. People are also usually worried about the opioid crisis and the housing crisis. Um, so you can usually add in things like that. Um, usually just try and sort of multi-solve as local governments are usually trying to do anyways. And then the other key thing is we had a presentation today where they were talking about um, working with other people and you want to use this the SCARF model, which is like um, it's like status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. But they said the key thing is relatedness. So when you're bringing things forward and working with people who may be sort of on the other side to you, um, to start with things that make people feel like they're trusted and like they're belonging. Um, so you want to start with small connections um, of similarities with people, even if they're politically diverse. And then once you've made that base layer, it's a lot easier to talk about the things that might be uh, more difficult. Thank you. Um, there is also the issue, and I, I see, we'll, we'll come back to some of the other questions over here in a second, but I also, um, there were several sort of comments and questions, and I see Tara's also asked this, about how do we balance um, particular climate actions, and how do we understand and like make explicit among climate champions or staff champions or the other folks that you're naming in this work, um, how human rights and, and environmental rights are kind of entwined in what choices we're making. Like thoughts about how, how we're engaging people in particular ways to ensure that human rights are part of the equation. I can take a crack at it or go ahead, Sebastian. No, go ahead. I'll, I, I got comments. Too. Well, I, I was kind of hoping somebody else would go first. I mean, this is a really, really tough question, right? Um, uh, we were talking uh, before um, about values. Um, I think that they're, to, to bring it back to GANs and GANs' organizing model, right? It goes uh, values and then emotions and then actions, right? So um, we have a lot of the same values when we talk about the environment, when we talk about um, human rights. So I think maybe like cross-pollinating those, and then you get that emotional reaction from folks and that spurs them to actually acting. So, I mean, this is, I think this is a lot about um, creating those broader coalitions, but I think, it, I think it's a tough thing to do um, uh, in the municipality, especially just because of the 
um, sort of specific level of government we're talking about and the powers that are available there. Though municipalities, of course, can do lots of things that are novel as well. So, um, I mean, I, I'd be interested to hear from the other two panelists if they have any uh, insights on those. Mm -hmm. And do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, in my, my work with the, you know, with the Climate Caucus, I think this balancing of human rights and, and, and social needs and equity uh, with the environmental uh, values and, and uh, missions is, is been critical part of the dialogue. And, you know, in, the, in Nanaimo, we're, we're all about the donut now. So meeting the needs of, of everyone within the means of the planet, and they both go hand in hand. And uh, uh, climate justice is, is social justice, because at the end of the day, folks uh, that, you know, are going to suffer the most is, is the ones that are, you know, um, yeah, where, the, where the most inequity exists. And I think that one, one thing that I always take with me is just like always looking at when the decisions are being made and the policies being developed, uh, whose voices are at the table on that? And, and always it's biased towards, you know, the, the folks that have been there for a long time of which, you know, I, unfor I unfortunately do represent that a bit more. And I look at the equity around our council table and then just trying to like always at every step, try to build a more uh, diverse uh, set of voices within committees and that. And I think that's like the, the thing that we need to pay the most attention to um at, at all steps to sort of build that more uh that more equal and you know social justice element into into decisions and policies no thank you for that there's a saying in the environmental justice movement about not for us without us um and so it's that idea of who's at the table and who is making those powerful decisions and not just being consulted or consent but literally having the power in decision making so yeah i agree um, Alex, anything to add on that before we throw on another question? Um, not really that much else to add. I, I will also say in terms of the having people at the table part um, is also just making sure that you're uh, breaking down the barriers that would keep people from being able to come to the table. So, you know, providing childcare, um, transportation at a time when people are going to be able to make it, um, things like that. But other than that, I agree with everything everyone else said. Maybe if I could just briefly interject, um, it yeah, just when Ben was talking, it struck me so um, squarely on the head how different different municipalities, like the different places that they're at with this. And so sort of knowing what's going on in your municipality is very important and sort of seeing the example being set elsewhere, I think is also very important. Um, so you can take those good ideas and bring them to your own uh, backyard. And actually that, Sebastian, thanks for that, because that that's one of the things that we've been thinking about inside the Islands Trust too, is like as we, we pass both a reconciliation and a climate emergency motion at the same time in the trust. And so like trying to figure out what the reality of that is as we implement it is, is new, right? And so like understanding that we're all learning from each other. And so part of the networking is networking among um, counselors themselves in different contexts to try and figure out like what, what are the next steps? Yeah. All right, so there's a few things here. Here's a good one. Any tips when the city manager or senior staff are blocking certain types of climate policy and pushing for business as usual? Thoughts around how to, and I, I know you've, you've named a number of things around relationships, all three of you have actually named about relationship building. So how do you build relationships when there's actual like blockages being put up in front of you and you know counter values and counter opinions going on? I've got stuff to say on that for sure. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that um, there's always resistance at all levels. I think that there is sort of a, an older economy and culture that has, has had the had the power, and um, that it, there is strong resistance, and we feel in our council all the time. And and I think that one of the things I've noticed is that uh, you know. At the beginning, the, the climate activists were in the minority, I think it was with any type of change. And then as your majority grows and the, the power grows, you're at a point where sometimes there's a bit of timidity to like really push when the resistance is there. And what I've noticed is that like having that community support behind you, knowing that this is the right thing to do and then push when it's time to push because staff will push back. They want to do this. They, they, the funding needs to go elsewhere. Or this is too extreme of a goal. Um, and there's there's constant feedback on that and, and you have to really put the foot foot down and like be brave and and i think that type of bravery is is very important 
and 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 you get brave by by the, the strength of your network and the support of the people that are in there with you um and and don't be shy because i think that that's what the 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 barriers always do is like oh you know they're being unreasonable or you know they're this is too too extreme or uh, we can't do this and so i think that just know that that's what it looks like resistance and to, and to be brave go ahead alex um yeah i agree with everything that ben said uh wholeheartedly and uh i think the other big thing with local governments especially is that they never want to lead and especially staff they never want to lead they don't want to be the first one doing anything so as long as you can find an example of somewhere else that they've done this and it's worked then you can say look we're not leaders but we don't want to be the last ones to do it and that's a much easier way to convince people um so success stories are always really important mm -hmm. I, I really agree with that, Alex, because to Sebastian's earlier point, um, one of the things that we were able to do is leverage Vancouver's climate action motion when we did ours and having that kind of precedent, even if it was just one <laughs> the time, like really helped. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, um, uh, Councillor Curran in District of North Vancouver always says it's the best thing having Vancouver across the water because she can say, you say we can't build buildings like that. Well, they did it over there, so we can do it here. We're just a little bit like on the other side, so yeah. Well, I'm right. so uh, I'm so jealous of the these staff relationships you folks have because uh, when I talk in Surrey, it's like you know we're not Vancouver, we don't have the Vancouver charter. We're bigger than Burnaby, don't compare us to Burnaby. We're bigger than New Westminster, don't compare us to New Westminster. So there's always there's always some avoidance there. Um, it's really unfortunate, but uh, I'm glad it works better elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're definitely on the rural side of all that. Um, all right, a couple more questions and then we're going to open up for some question and answer and I put some instructions in the chat for folks. Um, so we will come around to some comments and questions from participants in a, a few minutes here. Um, so for other questions here. Um, when we think about um, actions in communities. Um, actually, I'm going to come back to that one. It's a little complex to word right now. Um, all right, let's go to is oh, here's one. Is there a role for universities in advancing climate action priorities in municipalities? And I would say universities and other sort of scientific institutions or sort of academic -y kind of institutions. <laughs> Thoughts on that? Um, I, I sort of have a thought on it. Um, one major thing that I know is happening with universities is uh, this partnership with uh, Iron and Earth, um, where the university is essentially taking on the role of um, sort of retraining folks that are um, working on industries that are going to be sort of shifting over um, and making sure that we have capacity for um, for the, the folks that are going to be able to do, you know, do retrofitting um, and implementing heat pumps and things like that. Um, and that is really, really important in um, small single resource towns because uh, they're sort of uh, looking at gonna be like being left behind potentially. So it's uh, the universities and colleges and things that are in those towns, it's really important for them to be um, taking advantage of this. And I do know that they are. Um, so that's sort of, I guess, one of the major things that I can think of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, universities are definitely centers of um, both expertise and sort of volunteer hours, right? Um, they're, they're useful for both. Um, uh, Springs of Surrey for Future was founded by a, a KPU, Quantum Polytechnic University librarian and sustainability um, office uh, individual. So um, sort of started there. And then we've had plenty of conversations and chats with uh, policy experts from KPU, um, especially mm -hmm. ones that do policy expertise and consultation with other municipalities across Metro Van. It's really interesting to hear that sort of inside baseball. Um, it gives you a different perspective. And then of course, um, students always have great opportunities to uh, engage, right? Whether it's club days or, or talking to a class, a uh, great way to get additional people with some uh, good energy onto your um, organization. Absolutely. So many different ways that universities can support at, at so many different levels. Mm -hmm. And I would expand that to one of the other questions that came in around industry associations, chamber of commerce and other nonprofit organizations. You know, I think the, they likely all have those roles to play in this work. Um, and they're part of that network and hub kind of activity um, that we're talking about. So and some of the things that you've named in terms of the challenges that um, 
local elected officials have in terms of time. I know we all probably feel that. Um, it's a real thing. And so any way that we can kind of build capacity um, through these networks is gonna be really helpful. All right, so I am going to open it up for um, some conversations with participants. Um, Heather, maybe we can take us all off spotlight here for that. And um, what I'm gonna ask is, I'm gonna ask people to keep their question or comment to like max two minutes, preferably on the one minute sort of vein, get it on the table. And then, um, I'm going to ask you to use your digital hand so I can have an ordering of who put things up first. Um, and I will just work through um, the digital hands. So please keep your comments short. And if you have a specific person that you want to direct it to, please do that. Please do be respectful. If I think that folks aren't being respectful, I will ask you to pause and um, you know mute you if you continue, because we do want to have a respectful and appropriate conversation. All right. Um, so first we have Sandy. Sandy, what would you like? And make sure when I call your name, if you unmute yourself. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Sandy. Oops, I think Sandy got remuted. Um, Sandy, can you unmute again? There we go. There you go. Thanks, everybody. I, I live in the municipality of North Cowichan on Vancouver Island. And at, at today's council meeting, they just passed... Um, the revised climate action energy plan that was originally passed in 2014, it's been upgraded for greenhouse gas emission modeling, et cetera. And so we're quite excited about that. We have an environment advisory committee of which I'm a member. Also uh, council is just considering whether or not to hire a new position of a climate change specialist to really lead the implementation of the climate action energy plan. So very exciting. Um, we're a bit in limbo. Sadly, our mayor uh, voted against the plan. Uh, it passed though, uh, but uh, when you consider that he's the lead on um, negotiating with the provincial and federal governments, that's a little bit of a concern. So we have some work to do. Some good things have happened and any tips that any of the presenters have around um, working one on one with uh, the mayor of our community would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy. And please make sure you um, put your hand down. Um, so any of the panelists want to weigh in on the idea of tips and tricks um, that we can think about in working with our um, local officials that way. Sorry, the the I just understood that um, just kind of waiting to to sort of see that uh, you know the, the the changes that North Cowichan and and putting forward this new plan and that, that some of the uh, councilor or the mayor didn't uh, vote for it and and how to persuade them to be to be more on board on that. Is that here at Sandy? Yeah. Yep. Uh, that was the question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that mayor can be uh, uh, be a little bit more uh, 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 unswayable in his uh, <laughs> in his opinions, but it sounds like there's a majority there moving it forward. So, uh, uh, what, what's the saying? Uh, really support um, support the coalition of the willing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We've we've got some excellent. Uh, staff and other counselor champions so yeah. i feel really positive about it mm -hmm. maybe just yeah. briefly I, I would say it's important to um not paint somebody into a corner if they're reluctant right you don't want to demonize him and then not give him the ability to change his mind right if you create mm -hmm. that kind of a battle line then there's no way you're going to get um their support so i, I don't know this particular mayor so maybe, maybe this isn't a, a possibility with this one kind of similar to in surrey here but um <laughs> Uh, so you, you want to make sure you don't paint people into corners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. I, I've often sent to people who disagree radically with my own stance on climate work. I've sent them information, helping them learn and think about the um, ways that I think. And if I have a majority vote on an issue, I'm not too worried about getting them on my side. It's more longer term relationship building effort. Yeah. Anything else, Alex, do you want to add anything? 
Yeah, I do think that sometimes the opinions of people who are like really against you um, are, are important to listen to, or at least so that they feel heard. Um, because as if you do have uh, like a squeeze of a vote, you know, then um, sometimes the people that are represented by that person in your community might not feel represented in the policy afterwards. So sometimes it's nice to, to hear from them and try and uh, make sure that they feel like a piece of them is also in whatever is moving forward, even if it's something that you could, that you don't really necessarily agree with, but maybe you can find some sort of middle ground. And then that's sort of a small step forward to maybe having them become a little bit slightly more on your side. But again, I also don't know this mayor, so uh, not sure if that's the best advice. Um, that does bring up something to Alex. It's just like, you know, it might not, it might be that if people don't know the mayor, like other people that know the mayor also getting to them, like working through networks and relationships. Um, Glenn, if you can go ahead and unmute and share your question. Yes, I'm wondering when you are uh, dealing with an issue that is regional in nature, um, uh, is it best to go deal through the representative from your municipality on that um, uh, topic? Or does one generally uh, need the support of the council in that municipality um, to uh, make a difference with the representative? Um, I don't understand whether there is a difference between uh, uh, municipalities in either uh, tradition or whether it's just personalities as to uh, how the representative will react uh, with um, the, uh, the opinions of council in general. That's for anybody. Thank you. Thank you. So my understanding is we're talking about regional government here, right? Yes. Yeah, so um, this is actually super relevant. Right now in Metro Vancouver, we're facing a huge situation with the South Campbell Heights development which is going to see a quite a large area, um, which is outside the urban containment, uh, urban containment boundary, uh, rezoned as industrial. So we've actually been doing a lot of investigation and lobbying different um, councillors who also sit on the board of directors of Metro Vancouver who make this decision. And it's interesting because um, some of these councillors have told us that they are following staff recommendations from their own municipality. And some of these councillors are just doing whatever they want to do, or maybe that sounds a little bit uh, flippant, but you know, uh, voting based on their values, right? So for instance, in Vancouver, we had three uh, green civic greens uh, voting. One voted uh, against the plan, which is for the environment and two voted for the plan, which is against the environment. Meanwhile, in other cities, we, we see them all voting as a block, even though they have some um, misgivings. So I think this is like one of those um, situations where you have to understand each of the specific councils. And what's what, what I wanna, um, emphasize here is the importance of these regional networks. We couldn't be doing what we're doing with lobbying on this if it wasn't the fact that we have all these force of nature teams in these different municipalities. And likewise with we can, we're hoping that we can use this as a way to talk to those other groups in different areas when we're trying to coordinate regional action. I think this is a huge thing where we need to build capacity and we just aren't targeting regional government enough yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there's another layer to this too where you have these layers of government, not even just the regional government, Sebastian, but the additional like provincial layer on top of that or federal layer on top of that and, and you know, First Nations um, layers of governance. And so like, what does that really look like? Like, who are we talking to? <laughs> we're trying to talk to somebody to like make these decisions. And really, I think some of what we're starting to see is what would it look like to actually have regional governance conversations happening with all governments sitting at the table, talking, coming up with plans with people who are, you know, stakeholders in community. So. All right, we're gonna go next to Eric uh, Doherty, if you can go ahead and unmute and share. Yeah, um, I'm um, uh, from Victoria, BC, Lekwungen Territory, um, but I used to live in, in, Van uh, in Vancouver and, when I was living there, I discovered that the, the regional district was really quite influential in uh, transportation decision-making in the region. Um, and 
since being here in Victoria, I've been working with people and we got our regional district to pass a new policy, which is opposing uh, highway expansion and proposing that this money be reallocated to public transit, walking, cycling, all with sustainable transportation. Um, and I, I just want to get the, the, the panelists to, to comment on um, where they see the potential for that kind of action at the, um, the regional district level um, in BC. I think, I think that's a great example of just sort of the power that local governments can have in, in provincial lobbying. I mean, like the, the province really uh, sets the, um, is the jurisdiction of the highways and they, they fund it and do all the repairs on it and, and run it. But if a whole regional district sets a policy and, and asks for something, you know, politicians at the provincial level do listen because these people are voted by everybody and it's like, or they're almost closer to, uh, the, 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 the public is closer to the regional government so that they're heard. And I think that there's a lot of room and I think on a lot of issues in terms of climate funding, um, you know, the municipalities are on the hook for a lot of the damages that occur. We're on the hook for emergency response. Um, you know, we, we pay a lot in the transportation. Um, you know, also with like homelessness and, and addictions, uh, the cost to, is often borne by municipalities. And I think there's like a, a, a renegotiation of jurisdiction and funding around between the, the local government and uh, the province. And so right now it's a very important time for strong local government voices uh, advocating lobbying for, the, for, for what the needs are of the community and um, to take advantage of it. So I think that was a great example of how a uh, regional government can, can have a stronger voice in, in moving things forward. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. It kind of comes back to one of Sebastian's points in his presentation. <laughs> and I, I think you called it cynical or something, Sebastian, but I think it's probably pragmatic is, you know, uh, the people in the areas want to be elected. And so if you're actually dealing with a number of elected officials that represent large groups of people, those voices are gonna be very powerful. Yeah. Um, anyone else wanna add to that um, of the panelists? Okay, let's go ahead and go to Jay MacArthur. Hi, my name is Jay MacArthur. I'm North Vancouver in this area of the Slil Tooth and Squamish Nations. And uh, just make a couple of comments. It takes a lot of time to develop relationships with the council members and, and um, work with them, but it is worth it. And sometimes, like so, someone was asking about uh, the regional governments, I was able to have form a relationship with Richard Walton, our former mayor, and get a park created in, on Gross Mountain, the Gross Mountain Regional Park, because he knew the right people to talk to in Metro Vancouver. And basically, I convinced him that it was a good idea. And then he got any, there was some people in Metro Vancouver who thought, thought it was a good idea too. But the best way was to to work through somebody who's well respected in Metro Vancouver. So that's an example where things like that do work. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, another kind of um, topic is with um, heat pumps. And unfortunately, everyone seems to think they're a, a great thing, but have you ever lived next door to someone with a heat pump? Pump. They're very noisy in, in single family neighborhoods and um, they're not very neighbor friendly. Um, I've been told that some of the newer ones are getting quieter, but um, yeah, so I, I know my neighbor has one. It's on his other side of his house and I don't hear it, but his neighbor complains about it a lot. So, um, All right, I'm going to pause you there, Jay. Sure. Okay. Um, thank you. We're actually going to wrap up questions right now because we want to give the panelists each a um, uh, couple minutes just to share any last thoughts um, from the discussion that they want to sort of take away, and um, you know maybe thoughts around 
how we, there's been some questions overall in the chat around how we identify and promote climate champions, um, how we work with staff, those relationship building pieces. So, um, but if there's other last messages you want to do, we'll give a, a three minutes to each of the panelists to just share their last thoughts. And I think we are gonna start with Ben first on this. A great, uh, I just saw a post to just the, how did Nanaimo uh, set a 90% diversion target and have that baked into our policy. And it's an interesting story just around uh, public engagement, but for our solid waste management plan, there was a community advisory council and, and I was actually on it. And uh, there was this older gentleman who had his PhD and he'd been long retired, but he was relentless and very outspoken and just demanded why these reasonable actions of like trying to like keep waste out of, you know, uh, out of our communities and reducing it weren't happening. And it really empowered me to, to speak up. And, and it was that community group that suggested the 90% 90 90 target, put pressure on the politicians at that time, and it got baked into the plan. And now this plan is everybody's, you know, gung ho on it. Uh, f uh, the politicians and it's really built community momentum, and it's always been this community group of zero waste, solid waste advocates uh, that push at every stage gate, and has really allowed our our, our municipality uh, to be a leader in in policy development on it. So it always happens from the grassroots. And it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it happens from, uh, you know, individuals just really standing up and, and being unrelenting on, on their demands for a better planet. So I see a lot of folks in here with that type of capability. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Alex. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so I guess, first of all, in terms of climate champions, um, the uh, Quebec just had a municipal election as well, I believe in October, um, and they had an organization essentially go out and um, find a bunch of people who would sign up to all, um, a whole bunch of things that they were going to do according to the climate, um, and then the organization promoted them um, through the election, which is something I think that uh, we can, has the capacity to do potentially and is looking at. Um, so it worked really well, and they ended up getting a lot of uh, community organizers elected as locally elected officials there now, um, which is great. And so a lot of them are joining Climate Caucus and uh, and we're getting to meet them. Um, and I do think community organizers as locally elected officials, I know quite a few who have uh, gone step from one role to the other and you make a great locally elected official. So I would, I would definitely recommend it if you're thinking of running. Um, and then I guess my other comment is that I did see some questions in the chat surrounding um, funding for local governments and the fact that they essentially have no money and don't get many, don't get much taxes. They only get a small amount of property tax. So um, yeah, I will say that uh, a lot of the funding that we are asking for, for local governments, Climate Caucus advocates for that from the federal government. Um, so if you are in your um, organizations doing any advocacy to higher levels of government, specifically the federal government, um, you know, always ask for more funding for local governments because they're really the, the level on the ground that's going to be trying to implement things like buildings targets, uh, all of these targets that you're seeing in, in federal and provincial climate plans, it really happens at the local level and the local government needs funding to be able to do that. So um, in any of your advocacy that you're doing, please just uh, keep that in mind and we'll all do our best to try and get a safe planet for everybody. Thank you, Sebastian. I wanna to touch on sort of two issues that came up earlier, uh, relationship building and partisanship. Um, here's a great way to build a relationship with a councillor, help them get elected. Um, we did that in 2018. We phone banked for a whole bunch of climate champions that we believed in, um, and we developed relationships with them afterwards. And that's a great way to sort of get started. And it's a great time for that in BC now because we're in an election year. Um, so, I mean, think about it. Um, the other thing would be to think about running yourself, as uh, sort of Alex was mentioning, that uh, sort of climate organizers can become uh, sort of climate councillors which is great. And this is sort of a huge uh, part of what we're trying to do here with WeCan and with the local government team. Local government team is the team that sort of has put on this round table and it's putting on the next three round tables. We've also got a couple of other things in the works, including a sort of database of climate champions and um, uh, a list of resources, uh, as well as different kinds of trainings we'll be doing to support uh, uh, climate champions getting elected at the local level. So if you're interested in getting involved with uh, that WeCan local government team, 
or with a, um, if you also, if you live in Metro Vancouver, you're interested in getting involved with maybe a force of nature team because we do the municipal stuff here. Um, I'm just gonna put my email, my phone number and the slide deck in the chat there. So you can um, give me a call. Uh, I love to talk and um, even get you involved with one of these efforts. Um, it's really good to be organized. Uh, we get a lot of strength from working together. It's much more effective than just trying to work as an individual. So I would just want everybody to take from this is to get organized and start thinking about the next elections now. Thank you. And um, since we have just a couple minutes extra here, I will throw in a, a last comment as well. Um, I'm on a Zoom call right now. Um, and so we, we can, yeah, thanks, Heather. Um, and so um, one of the things I think that I'm in a rural context, which came up several times in the chat. Um, and so while rural communities don't contribute in quite the same way to the um, greenhouse gas emissions as cities do, they have incredible potential for carbon sequestration and mitigation efforts in terms of forest preservation, eel grass, and kelp beds, other types of things, and transportation, alternative transportation networks would be a boon in this region, in, in regions generally that are rural. So, but they, they have a bunch of different challenges and local government uh, climate champions like Sebastian saying in those spaces may look a little different than you see in some of the urban areas, but they're really important. And so really figuring out how to do that in those rural regional governments and or local um, unincorporated areas is gonna be really important. Um, so I encourage people to do that too. We don't want to leave any space behind right now. At this point, every space needs to be engaged in, in working toward um, climate justice, hopefully, and um, deep climate change. So thank you all for your time and your thoughts. And thanks to everyone who <laughs> offered questions and, and comments. Um, and I will hand it back to Dave. Thank you. Thanks so much, Devin. Unfortunately, we are out of time. It's obviously a really interesting conversation. A lot more can be said about the topic. On behalf of West Coast Climate Action Network, I'd like to thank our three panelists, Sebastian, Alex, and Ben, and of course, our great moderator, Deb, for sharing their time, expertise, and experiences today. You can add your thanks in the chat. And I'd also like to thank uh, all the participants, all of you, for your time and expertise in the, in the comments and questions. The chat has been very interesting. Um, and thanks for making it worthwhile to put this on. <coughs> Again, we'll be holding in the coming few months on the third Wednesday of each month. The next one is February 16th, and the topic will be recruiting climate champions to run for council, obviously essential in order to accelerate climate action. <coughs> and, excuse me. And we'll be having some tips and suggestions on how to find and recruit activists to run for elected office. We've got a couple of confirmed presenters so far, Ned Taylor of the District of Saanich and Megan Curran, District of North Vancouver, both, both elected officials. Uh, for, for details, watch the weekend website event page, westcoastclimateaction.ca slash events slash. If you have any suggestions, feedback, ideas, volunteers, wish to donate or anything else, please don't hesitate to contact us. There's a contact us page on the website. On behalf of We Can, I'll thank all of you again, uh, and please stay healthy, have a great night, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>